Well, good evening, everyone from Asheville, North Carolina, uh, where we are resisting the building of a plant here, Pratt & Whitney plant, which is a division of Raytheon, whom I suspect most of you know about. And um, we've been at it for about nine months when we found out about it. And uh, our session this evening is going to fill you in on uh, what we know, what we've learned about how the military industrial complex, Raytheon in this case, worms their way into your community and uh, what we've done to resist it and how we're thinking about it as a, in a basically like a case study. It's not unique here in Asheville, but how it represents how the military industrial complex functions when they build their there are facilities all over the place in every district in this country and around the world, I should say. So uh, we're gonna introduce ourselves and um, then we have a slide presentation. Where we'll take some turns talking about some of the information that we have to share with you, pictures and some information. And then we'll hopefully have at least half the time for questions and answers and comments and all that. Um, by the way, the music that you heard uh, as you came into the session was from Tom Nielsen who uh, sent that to us as a sort of gift. Uh, it, basically, it's about Raytheon. He mentions Raytheon in the song. Um, and I want to uh, encourage you all to, uh, if you have questions, and I hope you do, to put them into the Q&A feature. Uh, it's hard to find them when they're just buried in the chat. Um, so if you come up with a question, please put it in Q&A. We'll address those at the end of our presentation. and. Um, and then, you know, wherever that goes, that's, that's where it goes after that. Um, let's see, maybe that's all I need to say right now. I'll introduce ourselves. My name is Ken Jones and uh, I, we all live in Asheville. I live here and I'm a member of the Asheville chapter of uh, Veterans for Peace 099. And I'm Melody Shank and I moved to Asheville um, seven years ago after retiring from being a professor of teacher education. And I um, was uh, at the beginning of uh, our Reject Raytheon AVL coalition and I'm the webmaster for the, for the group. Hi, I'm Claire Clark. I'm, I'm also, uh, I've lived in Asheville for about 20 years. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation um, and also of Answer Coalition, Act Now to End War and Stop Racism. All right. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here with you all. And uh, let's see here. Um, There, I think that should do it. Okay, so what you're looking at here is uh, what our website used to look like. We just recently changed it, encourage you to go there. Um, we'll show you our, our website URL here before too long and at the end. Uh, so we're calling this our, our resistance, Asheville's resistance to the military industrial complex. And um, I wanna begin by showing you some pictures of the site where this Pratt and Whitney plant is gonna be built. Um, I mentioned that we only found out about it nine months ago in October, but they, uh, the local chamber of commerce and the local movers and shakers here had been working on that, you know, for close to a year before that. And um, what you're looking at in this picture is when we found out about it, we didn't even know it was Pratt and Whitney. Apparently many of the decision makers didn't know either. They called it Project Ranger. And they immediately started uh, leveling trees and uh, leveling the ground. Uh, so this is in October, 2020. And you can see what the surrounding mountainsides look like, beautiful, right, forest. And so uh, what we're facing here is some mountaintop removal. And that picture here is taken by a TV station, an aerial shot uh, early in the game. We uh, quickly came together as a coalition. We'll tell you about our coalition called Reject Raytheon. Uh, young and old alike, uh, we found each other at a, uh, a commissioner, county commissioner's hearing uh, where we all showed up to protest this development and uh, soon came together and formed our coalition. Uh, there's a couple of the young people got up there on that land that you just saw from above with uh, one of our early banners, No War Profiteers. And there you can see our website on that banner. 
So a little bit later, you can see they've completely leveled that top. Um, it's private property. It's uh, trespassing to go up there and look at it, which uh, I've managed to do a few times anyway. And this is a picture from the site in February that you can see it's uh, been quite, quite a bit of destruction that's gone on. Uh, and this has taken more recently, just a month ago, really. Uh, and now they're uh, well on their way. They've got a foundation in, they've got all the equipment up there. They've got moved the materials up there on top of this hill and they're getting ready to put the walls and the roof and build the building. Uh, 1.2 million square foot turbine airfoil plant. It's parts for jet engines. Pratt & Whitney makes jet engines and that's what they do for Raytheon. They do it for commercial and military uh, flights. Uh, further down the hill, this is the access. They uh, are building a five-lane bridge. And again, imagine this all being trees. Uh, so they took out the trees and they're, you know, they're paving paradise here. They're building a bridge and putting in a road across the French Broad River, which we'll also talk about the dangers uh, presented to our Deer River here. This is an aerial view. Um, and so I want to point out to you, here's the river, the French Broad River. It comes right into Asheville. This is another aerial shot. This is from Google Earth of the site that they're excavating. They're actually further along than this looks from this shot. The bridge that we just showed you is right here and they're building that road where this yellow line is going right in here to a parking lot where uh, all their people, their employees will be parking and working. Blue Ridge Parkway, some of you may know, it's a federal park. It goes right through here, beautiful Blue Ridge Parkway. And so it's tucked in. This cannot actually be seen. This site can't be seen from this road over here, uh, which leads to the bridge. It can't be seen from the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway. And um, yeah, so there's not a lot of resistance. We spend a lot of our time trying to raise people's attention about what's going on there. Uh, so I want to uh, begin just by many of you, I'm sure, know about Raytheon. You may not know about Pratt & Whitney. So Pratt & Whitney is a division of Raytheon. They were just uh, purchased. They were part of United Technologies, and they, uh, which merged with Raytheon just last year. So now they're a division. Um, they uh, are headquartered in Connecticut. As you can see, they are laying off people in Connecticut, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about the workforce. Um, they make engines for commercial, but you can see they also make engines for military flights, especially the so-called state-of-the-art F-35 boondoggle that it is. Used in 27 Air Forces, 7,000 military engines currently in service in the world. Um, they've been in business for something like 95 years. I believe they have seven facilities in the U.S. So they're big um, and they are uh, getting bigger. You can see their annual revenue down there below. And Raytheon, now this has to be uh, known among most of you uh, for, and it is the second largest war contractor. You can see that they have quite a large value, market value, 132 billion. They have four divisions, Pratt Whitney being one of them. And uh, they're a Fortune 50 company, not just 500 company. In 2019, they had revenues of 77 billion, CEO compensation of 21 and a half million. Um, you can see just from some of the text here, there's a lot of text there, I'll give you a chance to look at it, that they are sort of the all purpose war profiteer. They do planes and missiles and sensors, digital radar, air traffic control, satellites, communications networks, battle management, logistics, electronic warfare, hypersonic weapons now, cybersecurity and nuclear weapons, and just got a contract not too long ago for the LRSO, the Long Range Standoff Cruise, Nuclear Cruise Missile, a newly developed thing. So Raytheon is, uh, yeah, one of the worst war profiteers in the world. So now we wanna talk about how was Pratt & Whitney brought to Asheville in the first place? Most of our discussion is gonna be, what does it look like on the ground when one of these humongous war profiteers comes to your town? So now we'll have Melody talk to you about that. You're muted, Melody. 
That's the question that um, many of us in Reject Raytheon asked ourselves um, when we found out that Pratt & Whitney was coming here. How does a plant like this come to a community and the public doesn't know it? Um, it took a lot of um, investigative <laughs> research to find out the answers to this. Um, but there are several things that um, can be noted. And one of them is, is that they're brought, they were brought through a secret or opaque economic development process that started um, about 18 months before the public announcement. And it was um, a, basically a courting done by the state and local economic development agencies. Um, and it started actually when members of probably the Chamber of Commerce um, and both of those at the state level and the local level went to the International Air Show in Paris in the spring of 2019. Um, and there they began courting um, Pratt & Whitney. They sort of say that Pratt & Whitney courted them, but I'm not sure about that. But anyway, the courting process started. started. And for us here in North Carolina and for us locally, um, all economic development is a private public partnership that um, um, was um, put forth by our um, previous um, Republican governor. Um, and um, so that means that at the local level, the Economic Development Coalition has business people on it. Um, and um, uh, officials from governmental officials, but it's really led by the Chamber of Commerce. So there's a board and they have public meetings, but really those public meetings that we've attended anyway, Zoom meetings, the ones we attended, were really only reports from um, Chamber of Commerce staff. And as soon as all those reports were done, the board went into private session where I assume they talk about um, you know, more uh, substantial things. Um, they did report about the Pratt and Whitney and um, as sort of after this, this was after the fact, of course. Our county commissioners um, were required to sign a non-disclosure agreement that's state statute in North Carolina. And um, this is actually fairly recent as well. Um, as recently as 2015, the, the county commissioners were voting um, on uh, whether to sign um, non-disclosure agreements. Um, and so sometime between 1915 or 2015 and now um, the state um, you know, passed a law that it's required in these situations. The county commissioners also claimed they didn't know who the specific company was um, until the public announcement, um, which is pretty surprising um, to us, but um, that was confirmed by a state senator that we met with who had previously been on the city council for Asheville, and she said it was absolutely true for the city council. They didn't know who the specific company was um, that they were um, uh, considering um, tax incentives for. Um, but um, you can't help but wonder how a county government can do its due diligence about a company if they don't even know who it is. It means that the information there, I think, excuse me, I think it means that the information they're getting is from the Chamber of Commerce and from the company themselves. Um, they can't do all of the research we've done in the last nine months. The involvement of the private, private landowner um, early in the process is sort of unknown, um, but the landowner is giving um, the land to, has given the land to, to Raytheon. Um, and the landowner is a descendant of George Vanderbilt, who built the Biltmore Farms, and his um, George Vanderbilt's grandson is a CEO of Biltmore Farms, um, and another one of his grandsons is the owner of the Biltmore Estate, which every, almost everybody knows, right? So we don't know exactly what his um, influence was, although he's influential, influential in, in, in the business world. Okay, next slide, please. The other part of what brings them here is a um, political process, not just the economic process, but the political process that lack, that, that, that's not transparent or um, a, a process that uh, citizens can actually engage in. So you can't engage in the economic <laughs> development process and you can't really engage in the decision-making process. As Ken said, the public announcement was put out on October the 26th and the first time that the public could um, um, weigh in was on November, November the 17th. 
And that was after the commissioners were had a public um, review of the proposed tax incentive agreement that they eventually um, voted on. So really, you had a public had you know, basically two weeks to take take a look at that. Um, and the public comment period was the galvanizing um, event for our coalition. Um, there were 22 people that um, made public comment, 21 were against and one was for. And the county, the commissioners voted unanimously for the tax incentive agreement. Um, and the commissioners afterwards, um, in a meeting that we had with two of them, confirmed that the decision for that tax incentive agreement was already made before the public meeting. And, um, but they were required to have the public comment session, so they did. Um, it was pretty evident at the meeting that that was the, was the case. The committing for the permitting for the bridge um, by the Army Corps of Engineers and the North Carolina Department of um, Environmental Quality was well underway um, by the time the public announcement took place. Um, I believe it started in January. We have a timeline on our website about all the events that took place. Um, and it was actually quite a lengthy process. Um, and at that point, it was called Project Ranger. And so even as, as a citizen trying to find out, um, you wouldn't have necessarily known that it was the Pratt & Whitney plant. Um, it, we were fortunate that when I think Ken um, contacted the Department of Environmental Quality, the supervisor told him that we would have to search for a Project Ranger. Um, and then you can find all of the documents, but it's not an easy process at all. I spent hours and hours and hours trying to track all of the permitting and, you know, um, the this decision by the Army Corps of Engineers, that document was 200 pages long. So it's not an easy process for, for citizens to be involved in. And then at the county level, another review process is the board of adjustment review that the, um, that, uh, Pratt and Whitney had to go through. Um, and it's a quasi judicial process that requires all witnesses to have standing of some sort and to um, present evidence. And that means that you have to be have, um, you know, some professional knowledge and background in order to be considered um, a witness withstanding. One of our members uh, attempted to be a witness withstanding at their review of the Pratt and Whitney plan, and he was allowed to speak, but he wasn't allowed to be a witness of standing, um, which basically means I think that they can disregard anything <laughs> he had to say. Um, you know, and he was up against the other, you know, the witnesses of standing were people like the art, architect of the plant, the civil engineer and lawyer from Pratt and Whitney. Um, and so really that review process is impossible to go through without um, a lawyer. And I think that's true in navigating all of the environmental um, permitting that has to take place, not only for the bridge, which was fairly, once I found it, um, it was, you know, you could access it, but there's, you know, there's all, all kinds of permitting, environmental permitting that takes place at the county level um, that frankly, we, you know, we didn't follow. Okay, Ken, next. So one of the other thing that brings a company like Pratt & Whitney is, in this case, a million dollars in state, local, and private subsidies. So as we said, the county gave, um, was, is in an agreement, a tax incentive agreement with Pratt & Whitney, or with Raytheon, I suppose. And they have, they gave, they granted um, Pratt and Whitney a $27 million um, tax incentive grant over uh, 10 years. Um, so basically Pratt and Whitney, if they meet their performance um, indicators, get $2.6 million um, in, in uh, actually they, they're given that much money, excuse me. Um, the state also at the same time at the beginning of the project gave Pratt & Whitney $15.5 million in a job um, development grant. The land owner um, you know, gave the land, I think it cost them like $100 or something, but the value of the land is $6.1 million. Now he says that the value of that land is impossible to, to um, ca um, account or calculate, but the county certainly knows how to calculate it. And that's what the, rec the records show that the land is actually worth that much money. The um, 
we were also told that you know the deciding factor for Pratt and Whitney was that they had to have access. This particular site is not um, um, accessible by a road at this point, except a um, dirt road, um, and they needed to have access. So the bridge you saw is the initial access to the, to the site. And they, um, Pratt and Whitney, actually built more farms. Received a um, grant from the a found, a state foundation to to build the um, bridge, um, and that foundation is a foundation that was set up um, with um, tobacco settlement money. And interestingly, most of their their goals are primarily about um, supporting rural. Um, counties that were um, particularly affected by um, by the loss of tobacco growing and processing. Um, but this pa past year in 2020, they gave one grant of $12 million. And there is a goal that says something about supporting aerospace. So I wonder when that, when that goal happened. And those, those were all things that happened early in the process. But since then, um, they, uh, more money is coming their way. Um, they are going to build a training center on site that will be um, a collaboration, I believe, with the community college, the local community college in Pratt and Whitney. The county gave them $5 million, the state gave them another $5 million, and Taylor Barnes, who wrote an article about us, um, figured that probably um, the community college is going to spend $4.2 million in screening and, and recruiting and training of the workers. And most recently, um, Pratt and Whitney um, has decided that an access by the bridge isn't enough and that they need an exit off of the interstate that um, is one of the boundaries of the property. And that, prop and that is still in um, negotiation with the local transportation body, um, but it, it will probably cost 25 to $35 million and it will probably um, displace other pro transportation projects um, that um, you know, are needed in the area. Okay, Ken, next. This is all to put in context that they're receiving $100 million for some jobs that I'm gonna talk about next. But you have to understand that Pratt & Whitney has already received in the last two years, $9.8 billion in defense contracts, mostly for um, logistics and maintenance of the F-35 and some of making the F-35 engines. So they're already getting you know, a bundle of tax money um, from the federal government. Um, and of course you can't help but wonder why they need $100 million from local people. Okay, next, Ken. So of course, as all of you probably know, the biggest draw is the promise of jobs. And when the, the announcement was made, you know, the media was all about the promise of these jobs. And Pratt and Whitney, they're creating 800 jobs. So just think about the $100 million that's being given by the state and the local for 800 jobs. And um, also they say they'll be investing $650 million. They also claim that the average salary for the workers um, will be $68,000, $68, yeah, $68,000 on the average, which for here in our county is well above the local average. But there isn't in the tax incentive agree grant agreement, there isn't any guarantee on actually the language in that agreement is very conditional. There's no guarantee of a certain number of jobs. They say they're gonna to try to get that number of jobs. And there aren't any requirements um, in the, at least the local um, agreement with the county that they hire locally or there's any affirmative action. Now, county commissioners told us that they're, you know, they consider them a good employer and that they have a good track record of um, hiring uh, workers of color. We'll see. The proposed jobs are over 10 years. The 800 jobs don't have to um, be met until at the end of those 10 years. And in fact, the agreement, the performance indicators that they have are, are really um, only creating 750 jobs. And if they reach um, 800 jobs, they get a, a bonus um, tax incentive. After 2029, 
they only have to retain 525. So that get, leaves them an out that if something happens in their industry or you know, workers try to unionize or whatever, you know, they can drop back to 525. The salary um, um, claims are also um, questionable. They use the average, um, in the mean, um, as an indicator of average. But if you use the median, which is a better indicator of the average, the median salary is actually $55,000. Because as you can see on the chart on the right-hand side, more than you know, two-thirds of the jobs at the plan are going to be um, uh, $55,000. So the majority of the jobs are going to be at that level, which brings the the average salary, you know, down to much less than sixty eight thousand. And a lot of the jobs, you know, the engineer jobs and management jobs are, you know, of course, pulling the average up. Um, and we don't know whether some of those managed engineering jobs, um, you know, they could be remote and they could be in, you know, Connecticut. They could bring in lots of those kind of job uh, workers from from um, one of their other plants, particularly Connecticut. We've also been told that maybe that the starting salary is more likely to be more like forty thousand um, dollars a, a job a um, career development or job development person at the community college um, indicated that they, that was probably most likely the starting salary. Okay, next slide. So as you can see, um, the plant uses all kinds of means to persuade um, local people um, that it's a good idea. Um, and we, our coalition, the Reject Raytheon Coalition, um, you know, is a group of, as Ken said, a multi-generational group that came together after the county commissioner's um, public comment. Um, we were some of those 21 people that voiced our opposition to the plant. And um, so we have been in existence for nine months doing um, regular actions and organizing. So here's a picture of one of our, I think this was actually on our first action. Um, and we have members, um, go ahead and click Ken, members of, uh, members of organizations. The organizations aren't part of the coalition, but members of those organizations are. So we have members of the, sun, the local Sunrise Movement Hub. We have members like Claire of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. We have members from the local chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. And we have a um, diehard um, group of Veterans for Peace in chapter 099 who um, are, are part of our coalition as well. Next, yeah, thanks. Um, we organized really fast um, at the beginning and learned what kind of skills um, everybody had. You know, we, we very quickly had uh, a social media presence. We had a logo, the beginnings of a website. Um, we really rapidly got the, a mission down and some goals. And um, so our mission is really to help to connect make the connection between the, the military industrial complex and climate, probably should say crisis, and, um, to, and to work um, positively for a peaceful, just, and sustainable future. So we want to prevent the construction of, and operation of the plant. And we know that at this point probably is not going to happen. Just we're way down the road on that. But we um, want to um, encourage our or demand that our local officials put a moratorium on bringing any more um, military industrial complex industries. We've done a lot of education of the community as one of our goals, and we've attempted to present alternatives to the, to the war economy in some of our presentations and writing. Um, and we're trying to build an inclusive movement across barriers and foster some partnerships. So I think I'm gonna pass it back to Ken to talk about the actions that we've done. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna show you a series of pictures that uh, one for uh, demonstrates the kind of actions that we've been doing. We've been meeting out on the streets almost uh, every two weeks, something like that. And so just to give you a flavor of our street actions here and some of the other stuff we do. 
So we did a die-in, one of the very first things uh, as we came together, a picture of our die-in, you can see our chapter flag over there on the ground. Um, there were probably 20 to 30 people here for this event. We have a pretty good core of people. I would say 20 to 30 show up on the streets on a regular basis, sometimes even more. Uh, this was on January 22nd. It was uh, to actually celebrate the entry into force of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, and as you probably know, Raytheon is a prime nuclear weapon contractor. So there we are in front of a, what that monument actually doesn't stand in Asheville anymore. It was mm -hmm. taken down Confederate uh, soldier and governor Vance. The Vance monument is no longer there. Uh, so we had, uh, this is at the site of that bridge I showed you earlier, right on the street that runs beside the bridge. And this was for an international day of action against the uh, war in Yemen. Uh, so that was our part. And of course, many of the F-35s uh, are going to Israel and uh, probably promised, I'm sure they are going to go to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And uh, of course, Raytheon has a... Um, a uh, plant and an office in Saudi Arabia. So uh, they are a um, prime part of the war in Yemen. Uh, the landowner, this guy named Jack Cecil, uh, owns a property and he has developed property called Biltmore Park, which is a commercial and residential area. And uh, on this particular event, we showed up in Biltmore Park. It was pouring down rain, as you can see. And uh, you only see three of us there, but again, we had a pretty good showing up there on that corner and a bunch of us paraded down into the park, right to the office of uh, Biltmore Farms and um, paraded around town a little bit uh, just to try to get their attention, to deliver a letter to Jack Cecil. That board there that says Reject Raytheon, by the way, is a light board, lights up at night. And I wanna thank Leslie Harris for teaching me how to do that. Uh, we show up at uh, the Chamber of Commerce, have done several times. Uh, this is just a few of us standing right at the front door with some of our signage. That eco death by capitalism thing is, um, well, of course, it's what's happening to the earth up there, but uh, EDC is the Economic Development uh, Committee that is part of the Chamber of Commerce that is spearheading not only uh, the Pratt & Whitney development, but actually what they wanna do is, and this guy Jack Cecil are aiming to do is use that uh, Pratt & Whitney plant as the draw for a, a larger hub, a, a, you know, industrial park, probably of the aerospace industry, who knows, defense contractors included. We've done banner drops. There we are on a bridge right across the interstate in Asheville. Uh, by the way, all four of those people standing up on the bridge are Veterans for Peace members. We did a long walk, a nine mile walk from the center of downtown Asheville uh, through the commercial area, at, through a residential area out uh, south of Asheville to the site of the bridge construction. And this was just the beginning, some of our younger members walking with signs. Uh, and once we got to the bridge site, we had a rally and then we actually had a, a ceremony and some speakers. And this is during one of those ceremonies. You can see the bridge construction in the back and uh, a couple of Buddhist monks, our friends from the Great Smoky Mountains Peace Pagoda. And um, I think everyone else in that picture is part of Veterans for Peace. That's our friend Lyle, one of our Veterans for Peace speaking. Uh, and most recently, just uh, maybe a week and a half ago, we did a paddle to protect Ooh. the water. And uh, our French Broad River is a big site of recreational boating, a lot of floaters and paddlers. So uh, of course, our concern is they're gonna pollute the water. And uh, so we got ourselves some boats and got out there in the water and paddled up to people and gave them flyers and told them about what was happening to the river. So uh, we've had a lot of other things that we do. Here you can see that we have a website and encourage you to go to it. It's got lots of good stuff on it. Uh, we have written a whole lot of letters to the editor and opinion pieces. We've done an outreach to businesses and local organizations. There's a spreadsheet where we try to keep track of who we've been in touch with. We've done a bunch of tabling, some people there tabling in that picture. 
We created some door hangers and flyers, put them on doors and windshields. Uh, we've had meetings with state and local officials. We have a bumper sticker that we pass out. We've done a teach-in, which looks like a webinar. Is, uh, so we've done that online. We've done a series of radio interviews here in Asheville, even did a podcast, national podcast, hosted a teaching with Christian Sorensen, who some of you may know, expert on the war corporations in this country. And we've done an online and a paper petition, which we are collecting signatures and we'll take to the county commission at some point and tell them how people are opposed to what they're doing. So that's kind of giving you a flavor of what we've been up to for nine months. And now I'm going to pass it over to Claire to talk in some depth about some of the issues that are uh, most of most concern to us. So go ahead, Claire. Um, yeah, I, what I'm going to talk about is the, the concerns we have specifically with the river, with the French Broad River, um, and also the labor exploitation that this uh, plant is going to bring with it. Um, can I get that first slide? Uh, this is the French Broad River. Uh, the French Broad has its headwaters between Rosman and Balsam Grove in Transylvania County, North Carolina. Um, it is the longest river in southwestern North Carolina and has the longest catchment area, uh, largest catchment area of any river basin in this region. Um, behind the Nile and the New River on the North Carolina-Virginia border, it is the third oldest river in the world uh, with a riverbed that cuts its way through some of the oldest geological formations known to science. Um, it flows through the heart of Asheville and Buncombe County. And every year, tens of thousands of paddlers, tubers, swimmers, and anglers visit and enjoy its natural beauty and cool waters. Um, the French Broad is ancient, it is beautiful, and it is in trouble. Um, can I get the next slide? Since 1872, when the Swannanoa Rail Tunnel opened Asheville and the surrounding high country of the Blue Ridge, Black Balsam, and Great Smoky Mountains to the big markets of the East Coast, uh, the French Broad and its diverse river and ecosystem has been subjected to the successive torments of extractive industry um, and exploitative and destructive manufacturing processes and unchecked overdevelopment. Um, First, between 1880 and 1930, the uh, vast old growth forests that once covered the flanks of our mountains uh, were demolished to the dirt uh, by the timber industry, and that left almost nothing behind but stumps um, and a few remnants in the highest and most inaccessible reaches of the hillsides. Uh, the abandoned pit heads of old Muscovite mica mines and kaolin quarries still scar the mountain flanks. Um, and for decades, paper mills and textile dye works dumped their toxic effluents into the French Broad River uh, and its tributaries like the Tow and Pigeon Rivers. Um, each year, millions of tourists visit uh, the Asheville area in search of natural beauty, unaware that these mountains are riddled with super fun brown sites left behind as the toxic legacy of um, industrial exploitation. Explosive growth in Asheville and the surrounding communities has brought with it the problems of poorly managed overdevelopment, siltation, and runoff. Um, when heavy rain falls, the sanitary sewer systems in the area, which are now grossly inadequate for the populations they serve, uh, pour hundreds of thousands of gallons of raw sewage into the river, prompting annual summer advisories from the French Broad River Keeper to avoid swimming in the river as E. coli re levels reach dangerous uh, levels. So that's sort of the background. Um, that's what's already happened to the river. And now Raytheon and Pratt and & Whitney are coming to add new destruction on top of the scars of the damage already done. Uh, our local political leaders and the company themselves have assured us that this time, unlike all the other times before in all sorts of other places, uh, Pratt & Whitney won't leave a super fun site behind. Uh, but even if we can trust those assurances, the sad fact is that it doesn't take a chemical spill or a toxic dump to wreak havoc on a cool water river ecosystem like the French Broad River. All it takes is heat and dirt. Um, 
the species which inhabit the French broad are primarily adapted to live in waters with peak summertime temperatures in the low to mid 70s Fahrenheit. When water temperatures reach sustained levels around 80 degrees, heat stress and the lower levels of dissolved oxygen carried by warmer waters can wreak havoc on many of the native fish, amphibian and invertebrate species native to the river. Historically, water temperatures in the French broad have rarely reached those levels and never for sustained periods of time. Um, climate change, however, is already altering that pattern. It is increasingly common for summertime water temperatures in the French broad to edge toward that lethal 80 degree mark and remain there for days at a time. Um, on a global level, we know that the US military machine and carbon and fossil fuel intensive industries like the airline industry and are leading in, uh, contributors to anthropogenic climate change. And it is these same um, institutional drivers of climate change that uh, this plant is designed to feed and serve. On a local level, uh, the destruction of a large tract of the river's vital riparian buffer, that's that strip of trees and plants growing along the water's edge, uh, means that the nearly daily thunderstorms typical of our high summers here in Asheville um, will dump their rains not on the shaded soil of an intact uh, vegetated riverbank, but on a vast expanse of sun-baked asphalt and concrete, uh, producing large quantities of runoff water that will enter the river at temperatures of 90 degrees or more. Um, even worse, uh, the destru destruction of the riparian buffer, which serves the vital function of holding surface topsoils down and preventing erosion, will add to the siltation problem that is already the biggest threat to the French Broad River ecosystem. Uh, silted and occluded waters that uh, hold the heat of the summer sun, increasing water temperatures. Soil particulates clog the gills of fish and other animals that live in the river, making it even more difficult for them to pull needed oxygen from water already degraded by rising temperatures. Um, silt fills in the cracks in the rocks, uh, where the aquatic insects that form the base of the river's food chain live, um, and it blankets and chokes out the gravel beds where the river's fish reproduce and spawn. Um, the Pratt & Whitney facility actually sits on a fairly sensitive part of the river. Uh, it's being constructed astride a stretch of the river known as the Long Shoals. Um, this area, which uh, has fast flowing and tumbling water, um, it provides a key thermal refuge to the fish of the French Broad, a place where they can escape uh, the dangerously warm summer waters um, in areas with slower flows and less dissolved oxygen. Um, it is a vital spawning ground for smallmouth bass, suckers, and other native fish species. Um, and it's not just the plant site itself. The construction of the bridge, uh, and an entire new interstate interchange will also inevitably increase the silt load carried by the French broad. Um, siltation also increases risks to humans. Um, it does fill up the river channel. Uh, it slows and impedes flows um, in combination with the increased runoff caused by the loss of the riparian buffer at the river's edge. Um, these kind of things have the potential to increase the likelihood and severity of floods. Um, and flooding is already a growing threat locally due to climate change driven alterations of our wetter patterns. Um, silt layers uh, on the river bottom also trap toxic chemicals from ag agricultural runoff upstream. And those lower flow rates that are a consequence of siltation also mean that the sewer out uh, overflows that are common in the French Broad Basin will dissipate less quickly, um, leading to even more of those days when bacteria levels in the river make it unsafe for swimming, tubing, and other recreation on the river. Um, next slide. So why is this, why is this happening? Ultimately, um, there's there's one reason we know what it is, uh, but for public consumption, the justification for all the damage this plant will do locally and globally is the same old mantra we've heard time and again, jobs, jobs, jobs. 
um, in exchange for our complicity in a brutal imperialist war machine, in exchange for the further degradation of our local environment and ecosystems, and the diversion of taxpayer money away from other priorities, our community has been promised hundreds of good jobs, jobs you can raise a family on, uh, the kind of jobs that are in desperately short supply in our low wage extractive tourist economy. Um, but war corporations, like every other business, they don't exist to be benevolent engines of job creation. They exist to make money. Um, Raytheon is not coming to Buncombe County on a mission of mercy to bring us jobs. Raytheon is coming to Buncombe County to turn a profit for its shareholders. Um, in this context, it is worth keeping in mind what profit really is. Profit is the difference between what workers are paid and the value that workers produce with their labor. Profit is the unpaid wages of labor. Um, it is born from a relationship between employer and employed characterized by a gross imbalance of power. Um, it is exploitative by its nature. And the only way a company can increase its profits is by increasing, increasing the exploitation of its workforce. And that's exactly why Raytheon is coming here. North Carolina provides Raytheon with a ready-made source of highly exploitable labor. Um, the state has the second lowest union participation rate in the nation behind only South Carolina. Uh, we are one of 20 states with a state minimum wage that does not exceed the federal minimum of $7.25 an hour. Uh, the Asheville area with its high cost of living and low wage tourism driven job market is particularly ripe um, for that exploitation. Um, Raytheon and Pratt and Whitney have come to our community to take advantage of North Carolina's extremely employer friendly regulatory environment and minimal worker protections. Uh, and also to use our working people and their needs as the thin end of a union busting wedge, it hopes to turn against its existing unionized workforce elsewhere. Um, I think Ken mentioned there are layoffs um, that have occurred already in Middletown, Connecticut, uh, but Pratt and Whitney's uh, facility there, which manufactures some of the same parts that will be made here in Buncombe County, is a union shop. And that union contract in Middletown expires in 2022, the same year that Pratt & Whitney is scheduled to begin, begin production here. Um, next slide. Um, the working people of our community are desperate for good jobs, the kind of jobs you can actually raise a family on, own a home and build a life around. Um, despite the claims made by the local politicians who have laid out a subsidized welcome mat, local media, and of course, Pratt & Whitney itself, the jobs this plant will create are not those kind of jobs. Uh, it appears that production line positions will start at around $40,000 a year. It's a little over $19 an hour in full-time employment. Um, that figure only mar marginally exceeds the local living wage for a single adult living alone, um, and it falls far short of an income that can support a family uh, on its own. Um, can I get the next slide? Um, moreover, we cannot forget that Western North Carolina's workers need more than jobs. The region has an acute shortage of housing of all types, uh, but the need for affordable workforce housing is truly dire. Um, Asheville's pub public transit system is chronically underfunded. Our divided county and city school systems, a legacy of the Jim Crow era, are also badly unresourced, under-resourced. Um, the same is true of other basic public services in uh, Buncombe County and in this region. Um, additionally, uh, we owe it to our Black and Indigenous communities to redress the harm uh, that has been caused to those communities by centuries of slavery, segregation, uh, di discrimination, and dispossession. Um, all of these other needs are currently going unmet, and meeting them will require the allocation of public resources and public money. Uh, instead, taxpayers are being shanghaied into forking over 
nearly 100 million uh, in public funds to be funneled to Raytheon and its shareholders. That's $100 million that won't go to affordable housing. That's $100 million that won't go to schools or transit, to public health, or to reparations for the evils of slavery, segregation, and genocidal land theft. Um, this is the eternal pattern with the military industrial complex. Um, public money should be spent meeting the public good, but with the military industrial complex, that money goes instead to the ends of private profit and feeding the bottomless appetite of the war machine. Okay, I'm going to, this is our next to last slide, and I'm just going to sum up a little bit of why we think this deal is, uh, you know, a textbook case, really, of how the military industrial complex gets into your community and how they uh, operate once they're here. So what we've been telling you, you can see from the bullet points here is, uh, first of all, it was a secret deal. It's kept in secret. Uh, and there were a variety of players, state, county, business community, all doing non-disclosure agreements, all keeping it away from the public until really it was a done deal. So secrecy is the first thing. And the second thing is there's the hidden influence of the wealthy, right? No surprise, in our case, it's this one person who is the local land owner, descendant of the Carnegies, uh, Biltmore Farms, uh, who was a mover and shaker, uh, influential with uh, elected officials as well as Chamber of Commerce. Uh, there is always the promise of jobs. And of course, what they do first is starve the economy with a neoliberal war economy, and then come by and dangle the jobs in front of people and say, look at here, good jobs. And so uh, that's how they divide the people who live here and sort of gain uh, approval of uh, the working class people. Uh, there is a level of extortion and that uh, they play one community off another. Uh, Asheville was chosen after, you know, if you will, a competition with a couple other uh, cities, uh, small towns in the Southeast United States. And, uh, you know, so they say, basically, you have to give us these tax rebates and a bridge and, you know, we want worker training and land and so forth and so forth. It's extortion in order to get them to come here and deliver on those jobs. They, you know, they got in our case, $100 million worth of subsidies. Uh, and of course, we haven't talked too much about the blind eye to local concerns, except about the river. Uh, traffic will be a major concern. Uh, people that we talk to when we do our leafleting and standing on corners do understand that the traffic is going to get much worse. That's sort of a primary concern to people. But as you know, and we know, the effects of war and climate emergency are the overwhelmingly monstrous things that they don't talk about and they don't talk about the effects of the F-35 on the people on the other side of the planet. And they don't talk about the use of the aerospace industry as, you know, the fossil fuel industry is what's gonna to do to our climate emergency at hand. So all that is externalized. It's not part of the conversation at all. And um, I mean, there's probably more to it than I have here as bullets. Maybe some of you can think of other examples of how uh, military industrial complex, when they get into your congressional district, of course, that's a strategy too. get into every congressional district you can. So you have the elected officials who are beholden to you. Um, so this is what we think our case illustrates. And lastly, I'll just show you our, uh, again, here's our banner. That's our website right there on the banner. JackRaytheonAVL.com. We have a, lots of good information there, including this article that Melody mentioned from Taylor Barnes that uh, national journalists came here up here from Atlanta to uh, follow us and wrote this great piece that's uh, right front and center on our website. We have Twitter and uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram too. So uh, yeah, hope you'll be able to check us out. Um, I'm going to end there. I'm going to stop our screen share. I hope there are questions and answers that we're going to have. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Melody to sort of moderate our questions and answers. 
All right, we've had um, three questions um, written in either the chat or the Q&A. So I'm going to, um, I'll do the simple one first. Um, John Ivins asks whether the river has ever been dammed. And I don't know the answer to that question. Claire, do you know? Um, you there are some dams, um, mostly small, uh, that create small um, reservoirs that don't look much different than the river. Um, there's a dam actually between Asheville and Woodfin for our metropolitan sewer, sewerage district for the main sewer plant. There's another dam um, down around Marshall that had uh, that was at least at one time a power generating dam, but it was like a one generator um, small sort of dam. So you it does, they don't produce large lakes, but they do have um, a, a couple of dams along the French Broad. Okay. And then um, Pete asks, what will stop Pratt and Whitney from bringing in their own employees, no training required? Ken, you want to answer that one? Well, nothing. In <laughs> fact, <laughs> in fact, we very much suspect that those 750 or 800 jobs, however you want to count them, uh, aren't all going to be local. There's no guarantee that they will be local. Uh, and so especially the high end jobs, my expectation and those of us in the coalition sort of think that, you know, the engineering jobs, the administrative jobs, some of them will probably come from Connecticut and they have other facilities around the country and world, you know, they'll bring in experienced people, probably the jobs that are local um, and go through the community college training. Um, they will hire people. They'll be the lower end of the, of the pay scale. Those will be the machinists. And you know the staff, you know the clerical staff, and in the maintenance staff, and I mean that's what I think. Maybe some of the upper end people will come from local, but you know nothing stops them from bringing them from somewhere else. There's no guarantee at all. Yeah, and I mean there's there's really very few guarantees for any of um, the sort of benchmarks and targets. Um, a lot of this ends up with language about the company will make a good faith effort, whatever that means. Um, so those those targets are are even those are kind of, even the the ones that numbers have been put to have a kind of uh, fuzziness about them. You know what constitutes a good faith effort to retain five hundred twenty five jobs. You know, um, so. It, it, there, there are just no guarantees with almost any of this. Yeah, except that Raytheon will make money. And we um, didn't mention, or I think I failed to mention, that this plant is being viewed as um, like a department store is viewed in a mall. Um, the Chamber of Commerce is head over heels um, about this deal because they think it will bring many more industries to the area, probably in the aerospace um, technology arena. Um, they're recruiting internationally and are thrilled that Asheville is, is now on the international map. And the landowner himself owns um, about a thousand acres, um, 445 where the hundred acres is that the plants, where the plant's going to be built and about 400 or 450 on the other side of, of um, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and it's you know gradually over the last nine months, it's been called become the Biltmore Park West. So there's definitely development coming um, that's beyond the Pratt and Whitney plant. So and related to in some ways to that, we have two questions about um, housing um, and public services. So um, let's see, find one. Um, David Scheidt asks, where are the new employees going to live? What percentage increase will be required to in increase the current number of housing stock living units? And Bob McKechnie uh, asked, is there any talk about the extended need for public services? The school district will have to grow more houses, need more roads, sewer, et cetera. Anybody, either of you want to tackle wanna that? I can say a word, Melody. You you know a lot about that too. If you want to, I don't know if you want to say something about it. Um, I can. I'll say that um, the word from the Chamber of Commerce is uh, that there um, 
you're going to at least break even with Pratt and Whitney with the, all the, uh, the county commission's uh, incentive that they're not going to end up paying out more than Pratt and Whitney pays in, in terms of their um, property taxes. Uh, we'll see about that. I can't imagine Pratt and Whitney being on the losing side of anything. Uh, but they also expect that um, uh, there will be other, as Melody just mentioned, other businesses coming in who will pay taxes. Um, you know, I think that that's a good question about the public services, the schools, et cetera, especially, you know, they'll mention traffic, but the, the wear and tear on the roads, um, I think it'll be a loss. I think it'll be a local loss. They're not going to be able to cover those expenses. As far as housing goes, I mean, you saw the sort of the figures that Claire put up about the salaries that the locals will make and the housing costs in Asheville are terrible. They're high. I mean, they talk about uh, building affordable housing, but you know, affordable doesn't really mean that affordable. Uh, certainly we have our fair share of people who are houseless right now in this town. And um, yeah, housing will be an issue as well. Not for the upper end of those pay scales, but for the lower end of those pay scales if they bring in people from who don't live here already for sure. Melody, did you have something that, I mean, you sort of been studying this, right? Well, only that, um... I mean, certainly there's lots of development happening in the Asheville area in general, and a lot of it is, is housing um, with this idea that there's going to be more affordable housing, but we know how that goes. They're required to have 10% of whatever units they build be affordable, um, and, and with that, and, but at the same time, they're building lots of luxury, luxury uh, apartments and condos. Um, but I'm not sure that that means that they are going to, uh, they're increasing it for, you know, the influx of workers They're in doing it right now because there's an increase of influx of people moving here from, you know, during COVID and, you know, um, sort of climate um, emergency ref refugees. And um, so because Asheville is known as a place that will have uh, sort of a lower, um, have lower impacts from the changes we're seeing in the climate. So I don't know, I think it's, uh, we'll, we'll see whether there's enough housing over time. And there, I mean, like, we are talking about a, a maximum that they're, you know, hoping to maybe get to of 800 jobs um, in a city of 90,000 people um, and a county of like a quarter million. So, um, you know, which is, I mean, these are, this is a meaningful number of jobs, but in terms of the number of people, the impact of the, on the housing market locally of just people for, that are, that might be moving here for um, Raytheon, for Pratt and Whitney is probably pretty small. Um, but the bigger, you know, the bigger issue with housing is with you know, a lot of these other priorities is the di diversion of resources. A hundred million dollars is, you know, consider, you know, that's, there's not a lot of things that have ever had a hundred million dollars thrown their way here in Asheville. You know, um, the scale of that resource commitment, um, in particular, in comparison to the relatively small number of jobs that it actually is bringing when you look at the size of the city, when you look at the size of the workforce overall. So, um, you know, it's more about the diversion of resources, the use of resources to fund this, as opposed to meeting other priorities um, where that's really going to grind. All right, so on to, we have a couple of questions from Kara. Kara, um, I'm just gonna read her. She wonders, uh, she said, I came to this session thinking we, you would address other Raytheon sites like the one in Tucson. I appreciate the techniques you have employed, although the effort here is to be like General Electric in the 1980s. I believe that we're forced out of nuclear production and in place mega corporation. Is there any main techniques of the ones you use that will be particularly useful to cause Raytheon here in, in uh, Tucson to reverse, for example, drone manufacturing? That's her first question. So I'll let, I'll let that stand and I'll do the next one. Well, I wish. Um, <laughs> you know, we've been at this for nine months. We're sort of 
new in our resistance. Um, the people in Tucson, I know Jack and Felice there, um, they have, I don't know, what, they've been at it for 10 years, uh, more. Uh, so, and we are also connected to the people in Massachusetts with Peace Action there, the anti-Raytheon campaign. Uh, so we do have a little bit of affiliation with Tucson and uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts has been at it for a bunch of years too. Um, so we're mostly learning from others and boy, that is the big question about how you stop the steamroller of the military industrial complex, isn't it? Um, when the, you know, the corporations have control, I mean, we live in a corporatocracy. They have control of our president and our elected officials and our Supreme Court. I mean, they, they own the joint, right? So how do you stop them from taking over in your local community? Um, you know, we're learning, we're trying, you know, to tell you the truth, we have hope to stop it. Of course, we keep moving with hope, but we know that we're in it for the long term. We know that this plant may get built and that we can't stop it. We'll try to obstruct it along the way. Um, but once it gets built, uh, we'll probably move into some kind of work, trying to connect to the workers in the plant. You know, um, maybe some union organizing if we can make that happen. Um, I don't, you know, certainly educate people about what the products of this plant are doing and, and probably try to monitor the river, see where the damage occurs and when it occurs. Uh, so to say, do we have a strategy that can stop the drone manufacturer? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say we do other than to just keep on keeping on. I will just say that um, in our the nine months that we've been in existence, been at this, I think really one of the um, most productive things is to do your own research about um, what's happening, what the effects are, um, because I think what we found, and we live in a little blue bubble here in Asheville, um, that people are uh, oftentimes in favor of our efforts but they don't know very much. So they don't, education ends up being a big part of that. Um, that and then a lot of people don't know enough to be a for or against it beyond what the, what the um, you know, media is telling them, uh, which of course is not very much. Um, certainly um, keeping um, the conversation in the media, which we've done consistently since the beginning, people writing letters to the editor, opinion pieces, commentaries, um, you know, um, has been important. Um, really tracking, um, we think, you know, we're probably missing the next project, <laughs> you know, um, because they have to get permitting early on, you know, you have to really be tracking all of that. And that's, that's full-time work. Um, just to track what's coming and in the, you know, um, Department of, of Environmental Quality and to be able to be as factual about um, who these who these companies are and what they make and their track record um, is important for local people to know. Um, and you know, like I said, that's that's a lot of work. Um, anything to add, Claire? Yeah, um, I, you know, part of it is we, I mean, like we've certainly been, um, we recently sort of did a retrospective ourselves of what, you know, of our first um, eight, nine months of work um, and looking back on what, we, what we've done and how we want to go moving forward. Um, and a, a lot of this work, you know, it, sometimes these things are a done deal when you take on the military industrial complex, you are really taking on the beating heart of, the system, right? We have a system that um, was born in war, that um, lives on war, that requires war to perpetuate itself. Um, so when you, understanding that, knowing that when you take on the military industrial complex, you are ta taking on one of the most central institutions of our society. Um, so it is not, victory and defeat does not always look like, um, it, it's not necessarily gonna look like stopping this plan. Um, it may look like movement building. Um, it may like, look like um, building this out so that these are instead of dozens of voices in 
um, one community that's thousands of voices raised together across the state. So, um, you know, a lot of that work is is still in front of us. Um, you know, like Ken talked about, we, um, you know, as this goes forward, we may have to look at um, worker organizing, labor organizing, um, continuing to push on um, at least forcing them to to um, you know to to be held up to the regulators to um, meet the requirements of um, the environmental regulation that we do have that kind of thing. But um, you know, it, a lot of it is is movement building. It is the you know building towards the future and not necessarily this one moment, this one plant, this one place. Let me add one other thing. I've just been glancing through the questions here. And um, one is that Bob posed the question, do we know anybody that successfully resisted the military industrial complex? And um, actually we kind of discovered one, I think it uh, is Christian Sorensen. By the way, I highly recommend, if you don't know this person, Christian Sorensen, he is really an expert at tracking the war, uh, corporations uh, around the world. Anyway, he or someone else connected to him discovered in Scotland, there was a successful resistance to a Raytheon office there. Um, I can't remember the name of, of the town in Scotland. Can you, Melody? Derry. Um, hmm? Derry. Derry, D-E-R-R-Y. That um, it, it took them 10 years. I mean, but eventually Raytheon moved out because after all this time, there were just resistance after resistance. They went in to the offices themselves, occupied the offices, they destroyed equipment, they got, you know, they got thrown in jail. They actually won in court, which is unusual, maybe not for Scotland, but it sure would be here. Um, but that is a, I mean, you could count that as a success after 10 years that Raytheon got out of there. Um, and the other thing I wanted to, uh, to uh, respond to was uh, Patrick's comment, uh, Patrick McCann, uh, I'm getting to that one. There's another one oh, too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have two that are somewhat related. Kara asked a second question about how we can further our how they, <laughs> the participants, can further our cause to stop this ongoing, seemingly done deal from happening. And then Patrick's question about, you know, is there any possibilities to spread this work nationally? The work that we're doing. You know, Lockheed Martin, the nation's top um, weapons manufacturer, is in his hometown, and perhaps uh, there's a day where we could schedule a nationally coordinated action um, at weapons manufacturers. Well, so. let me just say, hi, Patrick, and that is such a great idea. And um, you know, if Veterans for Peace could get behind organizing something like that, it, it, you know, we could make it happen. I think. And uh, I would recommend, you know, if you don't know Mass Peace Action, they are excellent. And they have a YouTube channel and they're constantly putting things on the YouTube channel. They're bringing people together. And um, so, like I said, we are connected to them and to the group in Tucson, but, you know, that's just three organizations. If we could get a national meeting or some, something, all of us together to talk about uh, all of those corporations. And, and again, I would recommend Christian Sorensen be in the middle of that too. That's a great idea. Maybe Veterans for Peace could help out with that. I um, was going to add in response to Kara's um, question about how you can help, certainly, um, you know, informing yourself by maybe going to our website, but also, you know, Asheville's um, claim to fame is tourism. So if you've ever been to Asheville and you love what you experienced um, before this plant's built and what you know from our workshop and what you learn on your own, you know, writing to the commissioners and the city council here um, is not a bad idea. They don't want to have tarnishes on their reputation. They're spending millions and millions of dollars to market Asheville as a tourist spot. Um, and, you know, so they would, you know, it would help if they heard from outsiders. Um, Try also the tour, writing to the tourism development agency, if you're doing this from outside, that, that um, is another one of these sort of public private um, agencies like the EDC um, that is, um, that specifically deals with tourism and has a lot of power in 
uh, Asheville. Right. Yeah. They're the ones that are spending the millions of dollars to market Asheville as a tourist spot and to keep the motels and hotels full. So um, we had the paddle that we did on the river. Um, most of the people that were tubing that day and probably most every day were tourists. And so, you know, even though we weren't talking to local people, we figured we're telling people about this plant and, you know, so that they're informed beyond what they experience in their tourist bubble um, and, um, you know, seeing some of what really is, you know, happening in Asheville. Um, so we had an interesting audience. So I don't see any other questions. Let me, if, um, if I can make a final comment maybe before we sign off, uh, unless somebody else has a question. Um, I, uh, our coalition here is an example to me of intersectionality of, of uh, causes. Um, and we came together around this issue of the plant. But if you look at the groups who were involved in the original formation, you know, Veterans for Peace jumped all over this because it's Raytheon, right? Here you got a warmonger corporation coming to town. So we were all over the war part of it. And here comes Sunrise and they see the climate issue, right? And, uh, and here comes DSA and they see uh, the political issue, the uh, NPSL, which Claire is part of, they see the capitalist issue. So- and the worker uh, issue. And the worker issue, that's right. Uh, so, so I've always, I've often thought that if you just come through any one of those doors, if you come through the climate change door, you're gonna find yourself looking at, you know, the war machine, how could you not, right? Or if you come through the war machine, you're gonna have to be seeing the climate damage. I mean, you can't not see both of them together. And then there are these other things as well. And uh, I'm really convinced that, uh, that there's, a place somebody said you know um kind of like strategies for the future maybe but um i think we are an example it's totally small scale example in our small little town in Asheville, but of a coalition coming together that is blending these issues together around one focal point and bringing them to bear and we do it in our flyers we do it in our teach-ins and um you know i think there's something to that i think there's power to that and i, I just wanted to put that out there Um, yeah, yeah, I would say we have, you know, for us, um, the building of this, the plant coming is galvanized us um, across, you know, the organizations that are a part of our coalition and, you know, we'll continue to work on that way because um, we know more things are coming um, and uh, we have, you know, there's work to yet to be done, even if we don't stop the plant. Yeah, I, I, the, there, it, there were so many different, there were a lot of issues that did bring us together, um, you know, coming from different angles, although I do think that there is a real unity of purpose in, in at the core of this, which is, um, regardless of what brought us there, everybody in Reject Raytheon um, is there because we don't want the war machine. We don't want it here and we don't want it anywhere you know um so you know we we bring different um sort of angles to that um but the war machine is at the very heart of so much of what is wrong you know very much at the heart of everything that is wrong in this country it, um you know whether you are coming from it as an anti-capitalist whether you come at it um as someone in for peace um, whether you look at it as the questions of racial justice that are um, raised by the violence that is um, spread by that is inflicted by the war machine around the world, um, by the violence that it you know because we know that many of these uh, corporations make the tools for war uh, for our wars. Then those tools, then when they're done with them in the military, they're refurbished. They're sent to the police. They're turned loose on people here. Um, we know really that um, imperialism abroad comes home as fascism here. 
Um, so there are the political connections, the connections to almost, that tie almost everything together, the climate issue, um, the issues of racial and gender justice, um, you know, they're feeding a war machine that is a rape machine, you know, it, it touches almost every corner of our society um, because it is so central. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, um, we're about out of time. I know. So that's good. And thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks and, for your uh, questions. Thanks for your comments. Yeah, let's Appreciate keep at it. it. Keep at it, everybody. We'll close this meeting now. <laughs>